Hi everyone, I'm Jody Barrows with The Square in a Square. Welcome to our live webinar today. I'm extremely excited to teach this basic class on the basic square and venture forth on the options of the square in a square system because it truly will change your quilting life and it will help you become the piecer that you've always dreamed about being. Now there's several things that I teach in the overall concept of piecing a quilt and putting it together. Of course, the main thing is the square and the square system, and that's what we're going to do today. It's been around for over 40 years. The same original ruler I started with is the same one that we use today. And then I teach the science of pack, patchwork, which is thinking about the cutting and the sewing and the pressing and how I can perfect on those human elements when my humanness gets in the way. And then also the overcut system about when we have solid units of squares or rectangles, whether they're in the middle of a block or on the outside edges of a block, how we can overcut them and make them larger so that we can go back in and trim them to fit perfectly. Now the human element in putting together is the cutting of the pieces the sewing of the pieces and the pressing of the pieces. Now, oh gosh, I don't know, 45 years ago or longer, uh, I've been sewing all of my life. I remember when I was eight years old, my two older sisters were so excited, my mother, the other you know, people in our 4-H group, they were so excited because I was officially old enough to join 4-H. Well, with two older siblings and parents that were extremely involved in our 4-H club from the sewing and the cooking and the animals and the farming and all of that, 4-H was just a normal part of our life. So I didn't understand that, oh, now I would be able to join 4-H because I'd been going to 4-H probably since I was a baby in arms. So I don't remember that not being a part of our life and I don't remember um, thinking, oh, I can't wait till I'm old enough to join because I was at every meeting and I was sewing and I was entering things in the fair. It just wasn't official yet and I didn't know that. So when I was eight, I was able to join. I, of course, started the, the sewing groups and that year in the style show, which is where you model something that you wore, I won grand champion on my garment. It was a cute little tank dress. It had a hat and a purse and uh, something to do with the shoes. I don't remember what we did with the shoes, but it was really cute. I won grand champion. Later I entered it in the fair and uh, won grand champion there. So I guess that was the, the beginning of my sewing career, which I had no idea would take me to where I am now. And um, so in the, the process of, of jumping over from home deck and garments into quilting in my late teens, I realized that really quilting was a little bit more intricate than what I thought it was. It was I thought it was just putting squares and triangles together, and it is, but there is a little bit of perfection that you need that the human just normally doesn't have. So I don't know, after making I'm going to guess 50 quilts, quite a few quilts. I was all about speed. I wanted accuracy. I was used to bound buttonholes and tailoring garments and matching stripes. So I was used to the perfection part of sewing. And of course, our leaders in our 4-H clubs were extremely um, particular about all of that. But when it came to bringing that over to piecing just these simple little units and, and um, shapes, I really was losing that perfection. And in the losing of that perfection, I started losing some of my fun. I had always been proud of my sewing and my work that I had done. And I would, you know, say, oh, look, I've got this quilt done to my, my quilty friends. And I was like, but don't look over here. You know, I, I kind of had to fudge a little bit or I had to make do or whatever. And that's okay. But we do need to strive for perfection and we do need to strive to be better. If we're not moving forwards, we're standing still or going backwards. So we need to be moving forward in what we love and what we do and we need to be able to be proud of our work no matter what level it is. So I'm not, I don't want to push too hard on this perfection because usually people think about the perfection as oh you got to rip it out and you got to hold your tongue just right and you need to learn this and that. I am the kamikaze of of the perfection. Let's do it like this. It's kind of um, against maybe what all the quilters and the rules and stuff go by. But hey, if you're having fun and it's getting done and it looks great, then it really doesn't matter, right? We all, I'm sure, have a microwave in our kitchen, which some say is not really 
cooking and it's cheating, but it still feels that satisfaction and that need of having something to eat and warm and done. So I guess that's kind of what we are. We are the, the microwave of piecing a quilt together. So in the, um, in the beginning conception of thinking about why was a quilt, so I started thinking about what I now call the science of patchwork. Why was, why was my piecing not what I wanted it to be when I had grown up with it being great and never struggled with it? And I thought, okay, what is a human doing? The human is cutting, sewing, and pressing. That's the human element. So that was where I needed to improve upon. So I really went in depth into figuring all of this out with the cutting, the sewing, and the pressing. Just exactly what do we need to do so that we can gain this perfection. I'm very excited that you guys have joined us today. I want you to go back over and watch this class over and over again. This is probably the most important class you will ever take in your quilting piecing life uh, of being a quilter or being a piecer, however you want to word that. And so we're going to go into the details of it. Um, I don't normally hit this basic square like this in my teachings that I do just online for everybody. I think it was 2018 the last time I taught um, a basic o uh, option overview and that was um, I think just on Facebook at that time. Okay, so enough of that. Let's get started with what we're doing. So every quilt we make, no matter what color, no matter what size, no matter whatever, every quilt we make start out with what we call the basic square. Now as we get into it, we can have other things that are the basic square, but it's still the concept of something in the middle with strips sewn around it. Now, I'm gonna show you all kinds of tips and hints today on how to do this, but it's just a simple square, strips on the side, and let's get going with it. Okay, now, from this basic square, you can trim this into any of the options that start out with a square in the middle. So that would be options one through 17. The first 17 options are the ones that, um, what we call come from the basic square, meaning a square in the middle, with strips on the side, and then the different ways you trim them up is how you get all these different triangle units that we call options, and of course those are the units you use to build out your quilts. So the, um, the reference book, this is our main book right here, the reference book volume one. It's gonna have those options in it that are one through 17. It's got like 14 pages of charts. This is your main core workbook. It has over 30 quilts in it. It's got over 50 sizes of blocks and it has 12 pages of charts in there. We're gonna look at some of those charts today and learn how to read the charts for the options that we're working on. Because once you learn the square and the square system, you understand the cutting, the sewing, and the trimming, and you get these shapes, which you need to build grids in your brain. You've got grids in your brain already from preschool and kindergarten of squares, rectangles, and circles. So now we need to build a few more grids in your brain with the seams that are inside rectangles or inside seams or inside um, triangles. So if you think about a square and you have a four patch, then you're gonna have seams inside that square for little squares that make up that four patch. So these are the grids that this class is gonna help you build in your brain. So you all know that to learn and to learn well is that you need to have visuals and then you need to do it. Think about class, the teacher would talk, you would write notes, that writing of the notes helps put it in your head. If you just sit there and listen, then that's just one level of learning. But if you apply yourself and do notes, that's another. And then when you go in and do hands-on, that's another level of learning. And then even as you're playing with these little pieces and you're putting them together in your book, that's another level of learning. And we need all of these levels to help make it complete and build that grid in your brain so that when you go to a quilt show or you go to a quilt shop and you look at different quilts or even just flipping through books, magazines, or online stuff, you can look at that and you can break it down into all of these different shapes that we offer with the Square and the Square system. Once you know, because you're gonna learn just how easy it is to make these and trim it up, and you're gonna get the confidence that you can make that great flying goose or that great whatever that shape is that you want. Then when you go in and look at all of these quilts, you're gonna have more confidence and you can learn to look at quilts with what we call square eyes. And that's where we're headed and that's what we want. Okay, are you ready? Pencil and paper, 
you know, watch this, then go back and, and start doing the cutting and the sewing. Watch it, watch it, watch it over and over and over again. Um, I would say 18 times. So your homework is to watch this video 18 times. That means as you're in your sewing room, put it on your iPad, your TV, whatever, and watch it and listen over and over again. Back it up, zoom in, You've got great access here to learn all the tips and hints and uh, points that we want you to do. So these little books are great. There's a if you're in Premium Club, there's a lot of downloads for you that are free that you can help use your book. If you're not, then there are some downloads that you can get and that you can purchase. This little cover is one. We have a new square and a square sticker. One lady texted me on the quilt text line and she showed me how she used her sticker on the back of her notebook so that when it's in her shelf, she knows exactly what's in that notebook. I hadn't even thought of that. That's a great um, idea. So write down the quilt text number. It's 817-713. 2879. So we're going to put it up there on the screen. So as you're working on your basic squares later today, this week, whenever, um, and you want to take a picture of something, take a picture or take a little movie, a little video, you can send it on this text line. I can see what you're doing. If you have a question or something not working the way you want it to, I can see exactly what you're doing. So this is actually better than setting in on a, on a class with me because you get to work on it on your timetable take everybody's or most everybody has a smartphone something they can take a picture with and they can send it to me on this text line so i can be right there for you not just during this class time which if we were in person that would be basically all it is but you have access to me and help all the time and i love the technology and the way that we can do this hands-on learning even though you may be 8,000 miles away, halfway across the earth, okay? All right, one little testimony here and we're gonna get started. It says, I just want to say I love your method of quilting or piecing. I've been a quilter for many years, but being in England, I hadn't seen your method until recently and I'm just about to start my fourth quilt. I'm so excited. I'm collecting your rulers and books as I can find them over here. And when I find them, I, I'm keeping up the good work and you are so inspiring me. So here we go, all the way across, um, halfway across the earth. Um, you can still get help and you can still learn the square and square system. Okay, so today we're going to cover, let's um, look down here. Today we are going to cover, oh, I hope I have my family in here. Um, let me grab my other little notebook. have multiple notebooks over the years. Okay, so um, here's your little cover that you can get to go down in your uh, plastic sleeve, cardstock, and some plastic pages. So here is your option family chart. So these are the options one through seven right here. And today we're going to cover the basic square and we're going to go in and do option one, 8, 11, and 13. Now all of these are what we call a family. This is the mother. And when we trim her, her DNA is to leave a fourth of an inch on all four sides. So that's like curly hair, blue eyes, whatever. That's the, you know, what the DNA of the mother is. And she passes that down to her children. So she has three children. She has an option eight, an option 11, and an option 13. So that means that when you learn this fourth of an inch trim, those are the trims that we're going to use. Of course, the mother has it, one fourth inch on all four sides, option one, and then her first sibling, uh, her first child has it, her second, and her third. Now let's, um, and so these are the options that we're going to do today. Now, if you already have your um, option book, uh, let's see what page option one starts on. So on page 15 is what we're going to teach with the basic square and the trimming of the option one. Now on this one right here, it does not have a quick trim chart, but I want you to notice, and I hope you already have your book. If not, get them ordered. And I do think we have a special on the um, original ruler and the reference book and the diamond book too. We're not doing that in our basic class of the diamonds but um, it is uh, book two of the system and I think you can get um, all of those on a special. Okay, so back to our 
options. I want you to notice option seven right here, it starts in with quick tips. And so those are really important on the options. So this one here on option eight, which we're going to be doing, it has a quick tip on how to resize it and any of that information that you need. Now, when we get up here to 11, it has a trimming sequence. And this is what I really want you to, to look at and highlight is this trimming sequence. Because once you learn the trimming of the, the option one, three, and four, then you'll be able to go in here and just say, oh, I want to make an option 11. This quilt I'm working on has an option 11. I want to make it. Let's look and remind myself of my quick tips. Okay. That tells me how I'm going to trim it each time. Now, that may not be of much value to you right now, especially if you're a real beginner with us, but it will come in mighty handy later. Okay? All right. So, when we make our basic square, of course, you're going to have squares and strips. And today, we're just making stuff for our book, so it doesn't really matter what size we're working with. A three inch is a good size and the one and three fourths inch strips, that's the width of the strip, is important. Now I also think it's important in, you don't have to do it this way, but I think we get so caught up in color that we forget to look at what we're doing. Because color is why we, color is really why we love quilting. We love to work with the, the fabric, the touch and the feel and the color. But we want to learn construction. We're not really doing anything on color in these classes. I just want to focus on construction. So in your patterns, in your books, when you follow them, it's going to tell you what size of strips, and that's going to give you the width, and it's going to tell you what size of squares you need to make um, those uh, pieces. Okay, so I don't know that I love that slanted angle. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, my cameraman's laughing at me. Well, I just don't know if they can see it the way I want them to see it. I don't want it to be distracting. Okay, so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to take your strip, and I don't cut the selvage edges off. That actually helps you save the good part of the fabric, because as you can see, you need to get started a little bit, and then part, start putting your strip down. So there's a lot of things I'm going to show you in the sewing that may be new to you. So pick up your strip, Start it in the sewing machine, sew about a half an inch into the good part, making sure that your machine is, is uh, behaving and acting the way you want it to. And then you're going to go down and you're going to lay your squares on the strip. Line them up nice and neat and even. You need um, about a fourth of an inch or a pinky finger in between. You need enough that it's easy to cut when you're cutting them apart, but not so much that it uses more fabric than what we need. Also, if you get them too far apart, they're just gonna be kind of sloppy, and that may mess with your perfection just a little bit. So try to keep them about a finger space in between. So that's going to be the first step. And you're going to sew as many on the strip as you need for the pattern or, or whatever it's told you to do. We're going to concentrate on a full strip today because we're working on 30 because that's about how many you need when we get into the book and start putting the books together. You may need more because you've used more samples or maybe you've miscut something or, or something along the way. Because we have three classes. We have today, we have next week, and the following week, and then we start in with Quilt Club Week. And I hope you're signed up either in Quilt Club Week or in Premium Club so that the party can keep going and the, and the fun never ends. Okay, so here you can see how I've actually actually have them sewn on and I've just p filled up the whole strip. So if you only need four, do four. You know, if you need more, then you have to make more. But, you know, it'll, we're not going to really worry about how many right now. Okay, so put your strip on. Then you need to put a long strip on the other side. Now, anytime I have to switch up colors or whatever, I always think about um, um, doing, and also when you think about fabric usage, like one of my text messages this morning w was, uh, I have a kit I want to use from somebody else. How do I know where I'm going to need more fabric? And it's wherever the strips are. Wherever the strips are on the basic square, when you adopt that pattern over to the square and the square system, that's where you'll use more. Not necessarily on side one and two, like we're talking about here, but when you get to side three and four and you cut those short strips to go on, because people make them way, 
way too long. We'll get into that a little bit more. Okay, so now I want to take my long strip and I want to sew on the opposite side. So see here you can see how we've sewn on the first side and then we have the second side and it looks like this. And let's have that little lattice in there. So after you have side one and two on, you cut them apart, you press, and then you come back in with side three and four. So let's go ahead and go over to the sewing machine and let's get started. We're going to start out by just kind of being here at the beginning of putting some on. I'm not going to do a ton. And then we're going to come in here and sew the other side on this one. So let's move over to the sewing machine. Now, if you, um, if you have a new machine, you may be, or I'm going to say a computerized one or, or something that has a lot of bells and whistles on it, you may not need to learn to work with the scrap in the machine. But if you don't have automatic needle down, if you don't have the little cut button, um, if you have a machine that struggles with the starting and the stopping, then this little scrap in your machine is a lifesaver. Don't ever leave your machine empty. We are happier when we have fabric in our hands and your sewing machine is happier when it has fabric in it. And if you'll notice, anytime you take your machine to the shop, every time you, uh, you get it back, it's got a little scrap in it. They don't leave it uh, empty either. This, the main thing about this is it helps keep your machine threaded so you're not constantly having to stop and rethread it because normally we pull it out and cut it. And if you don't have enough in there and if your needle isn't in the right position, then it uses more thread to get going and it could be unthreaded. So if you're having issues with that, with the starting and the stopping or the threading, then just always trick it and just think it's always sewing and put that little scrap in there. So my grandmother taught me that um, probably 60 years ago. <laughs> okay, so here I am starting my piece and notice I don't stop and lift up my foot. All of that takes a lot of time. This is um, um, smoke and needle sewing here. All right, so I've got my strip in the machine. I start a little bit and I start my square and I just make sure it's nice and neat and I sew along the edge. Now, depending on how long the feet are here on your machine will determine when you need to stop and load up your other one. Load up some more squares. And remember, just about a finger space in between. And of course, right sides together. Now, I don't like a foot with a fourth of an inch bar because people wind up pushing their fabric up against it. So number one, if you did it perfect, it would make a fourth of an inch, which is too big because you need to do a scant because you've got to have that turn of cloth. And um, people push up against it, which actually makes it um, a too thick of a fourth. It's a full fourth and we want a scant. So this is what I call brainless because once you learn this you can just do this in your sleep. Okay. So if you are, um, if you still have strip in the machine and you have as many squares as you need and if the color is the same on the opposite side, then you can just come back here and grab some of these and bring them around, okay? So I'm just going to come back here where it's easy and um, put this on, okay? All right. Now, if your work is scrappy, then um, you need to decide how many squares you can either get on that scrap strip or, um, you know, because if these are three inches, you know, if you put them, but butted them up side by side, that would be six inches, but you've got a little bit at the beginning and in the middle and the end. So I would say for the three inch, you need at least a seven inch length of there to be able to get two um, on that particular one. And if you're doing scrappy, then you would just 
put your scrap in and load your square up. It's, it's just the same. So see how this one came off of the back and I cut it. And see, it was in my hand because I cut it. So let's bring it around like this. It was in my hand and so I cut it. It's still in my hand and see how it's the first one that needs to come on. So it was last over here, but now it's gonna be first. And that's really important because I have seen students in class try to grab this beginning one and when they grab that beginning one and put it on look how they don't have right sides together so you need to have those right sides together so if he was last then cut it and bring it around and he's now first so if i'm doing scrappy i try to see um, what my longest strips are and work with them and then um, It's really easy to use scraps. I love to use scraps. And the easiest place to use a scrap um, is actually side three and four. But I really want to impress on you to think about mass producing, not thinking about one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. So if I still had some left in my machine, see I still had two when I took those um, off, then I can come back here and, and especially if I was working with long strips and I only needed five of these, then you, you can see how one strip will work for all of this. Notice I don't stop and pick up my foot. Put your foot down and keep it down. Okay. Okay, so if this was all of them and I have two sides on, then before this all gets up under your sewing machine, try to think ahead of what you're doing. And of course, right now, you're not sure what that is because you're new to learning all of this. But as you get going, try to think ahead to what you're learning. Think about where to stop, where to start, where to cut so that it gets a little easier. Now, I love having these five inch scissors at my sewing machine. It's just perfect for this uh, because I like to just separate. Um, I don't always use my rot rotary cutter for everything. They don't make these cute little designer ones anymore with this cute, but Ginger still has some that look just like this. They're all silver. We have a craft one, which means it comes to a point, and then this one is the sewing one where it has a little bit of a, of a bill like a, like a bird here at the top. But we have those on our website and get those ordered. You will love them. And remember right now to the end of September, we have a um, $150 order, uh, you get free shipping. So right now I wanna take all of this out. I'm not just gonna rip everything out of my machine. I put my scrap in. And see, nothing overlaps. See, this doesn't overlap. And in class, I see a lot of people overlap. Your sewing machines will sew anywhere from a fourth to inches without um, getting messed up. So you can come in here and rotary cut these, or you can just come in here with your scissors and cut them apart. And I usually like to just sit at my machine use my scissors. Now, if you have bigger uh, squares, you may want to have a little bit bigger shears, but a lot of times I just use these great little five inch. Okay, so now we're going to go over and press. Now, this is a little row into iron. It is a travel iron, and I love it. I like a small iron. It also gets very, very hot and it stays hot as long as you have it either turned on or plugged in. So I don't want to wait for my iron to heat up. Now, because it's a travel iron, the handle does go flat. So if you hold it down here and you push on it, you are going to uh, make that handle not be stationary, but stay closed all the time. So keep your hand back here at the back and give it a press. So I like to go over the top and then I always say open it because see how we're opening the basic square. Everything revolves around this um, center square in the middle. What size is she? Are you sewing her straight? And then pressing. So I just build on top. And I can do about 25. If we're working on 30 squares, I can do 
all 30 of these. Now I stopped at like six or seven, but you would do this process for all 30. Okay, so they look like this. Now, I do not have to go back in here and trim these up perfect, but if you're insistent on working with a foot on your machine that has a bar or a lip on it, then you may want to come back here and trim these up perfect. Um, but if it was me, obviously I would change the foot and not um, have that. Okay, I'm going to do something here and play like I need to change colors or change strips. So let me just cut some off here. And these are our new Paradise fabrics that we're using. I love the, the beauty of them. Okay, so here you can see how I'm on side two and I've got a couple of strips squares I'm putting on okay let's say that I needed these where the green was on both sides but now I need my my um, orange with green on one side and um, a different color on the other so I would just snip this off I would start my new color and this is the way it would be with scraps too. You just stop and add another strip to either get another strip because you ran out or to change that color on the other side. Okay, so here you can see I've got my same orange in the center. I've got green on one side and now I wanna put purple on the other. And that's how you would change color um, if you needed to do that. Okay, so um, I don't want to cut this off yet because it's a little bit cumbersome, but I do want to start with my side three and four on my short ones. So I'm going to do what I call a U-turn. I make sure my needle is down. I just lift up my foot. I turn my fabric, and now I'm ready to do my U-turn. So now I need... Um, a short strip to go on each side. So if whatever size your center square is, we're working with three inch. So your strip um, that you're going to cut that goes on side three and four, this is what we call side one and two. We use long strips. That's always the best place to do the, the long strips. And now we're gonna do short strips. So now you can see how easy it would be to come in and use up all these little scraps that you have left um, over from other projects. So, of course, I don't want the selvage on there, so I'm going to put my finger there, and I'm going to lay it across. I want to look at the cut edges, and I will tell you, this step right here is where so many people get um, lost, confused, forget, whatever. So, pay close attention and practice it, practice it, practice it. Look at the timing on the video for whatever minute mark we are so that you can go back and watch this over and over again. Okay. If this is a three inch cut square, then these have to be at least three. If I take the time to cut these a perfect three, then I have to take the time to lay them on here as a perfect three. And I want to slap them down, sew them on, and keep moving quickly. Remember I said kamikaze smoking needle. Okay, so I'm gonna lay it across my uh, square, and I want just a little bit on each end, just like I have a little bit on each end here. And I'm gonna mark that with my finger, my thumb, and I'm gonna lay it in my hand and fold it. Then I'm gonna come up and I'm just gonna keep fan folding. Now that very first one has that selvage edge on it and I don't have to make them all that long. See, they're just a little bit shorter. And notice how I started with the, the, strip, the cut end at the top and the fold at the bottom because Look how it just lays out perfect like that. And then I come in and take my scissors. And I just cut those folds.
Now you can see, how many times do you have a little pieces like this left over and you're like, oh, how do I go back in and use them? Look, look how marvelous this is. So laid across that square, you'll have a little bit on each side. And I just started in here thinking about where the edge of my foot will be along the edge because this center square is where everything has to um, line up with your seams. So see how my foot, the strip, and the square are all together. So all the way through. Now these last ones were a little bit longer than necessary. So you can see how side one and two, you really don't use that much more fabric. But when you come back in here on side three and four, you can really use a, uh, more fabric than necessary by making these too long. So these are plenty long. I could have probably taken a half an inch off. And by the time I have a half an inch here and here, that's an inch. So that's one, two, three. That's three inches too much that you can use. And so you can see how you can really um, use more fabric than necessary if you're not careful. And just chain feed these through. Okay, so once again, when you get wherever you need to stop, change colors, whatever, come back here and grab it wherever it's easy. Snip it to separate them. And see, he was last, now he's first. And we'll just repeat this for side four. Okay, so we're going to take questions here in just a moment on the basic square. So for anything that you've seen already today, if you have a question, get it in there and we'll address it here in just a moment. Now see how I like to use the machine as a third hand. If I start this piece in there and move up to where I'm getting close, it's like ready, set, and then go, then I have two hands to work with to work with my, my fabrics. Don't get too close though. Leave yourself room um, to work. Okay, so that's the sewing of the basic square of side three and four. So we're gonna clip, now if I needed to get everything out, then put my piece in, my little scrap runner, I always called it a spider, and then now you're ready to just cut these apart, just snip those little threads. Oops, and don't forget about that one that was, he was in the machine, so I, I, you gotta go back and grab him and get his other side on. So let's get these pressed and we're ready to start the magic of trimming. Okay, do we have some questions? Do we have some questions? Okay. Let's go ahead and put the camera here on the pressing. And while you're looking, I can be doing some pressing. Okay, so here they are. And you would have 30 or however many it is that you need for your pattern. Just kind of set, this is called setting the seam. And then uh, we're gonna open it up. Now, in my mind, what I'm doing when I'm just going over it like this, just the seam, um, think about if you're getting ready to do some um, exercise, you need to warm up your muscles. So we're fixing to ask this little piece of fabric to do something that it's never done before in its whole life. We're going to ask it to open it up. So see these fibers in here are gonna do a back bend. So if we get them to kind of warm up, 
Then when we come in here and ask those little fibers to do that back bend, and they're going to have to live the rest of their life like that, then it's, they, they behave, they perform, and it's much easier um, on your fabric. So heat it up, warm up its fibers, its muscles. Our muscles are fibers. You have to warm them up. So if you think about that, and then here is your basic square, ready to trim into anything that you want it to be. So at this point, it can grow up and be anything that it wants to be. Okay, did we have some questions? If you want to use um, a different color on each side of the square, how do you do that? Okay, if you want to use a different color on each side of the square. Okay, so if you're making 30 squares like we're doing today, and we have, you know, the four sides of the option. So let's say our first one was purple. Put your purple strip in or green or whatever color and load all 30 strips and do all of side one. Okay. Then when you go in and do side two, it's very easy to change that color. Just go in and put a different strip in when you go in and do side two. Then you're going to cut them apart and press, and you're going to have those short strips. And so it's really easy to go in. And at that point, you can go in and make all 30 squares different just by putting those different pieces on. I hope that makes sense. And as you see some different patterns, as you go through and look at the books, you know, read those patterns, look at that construction, and you'll see how we change colors for those um, individual patterns, okay? On side two, how do you keep your strip from getting tangled up? Um, when you're on side two um, and you are, um, let me see if I can get a little example here. Sometimes, um, so let's look down here at our table. So here you can see the long strip with the squares on. And, you know, if you're working with a 40-inch strip, it shouldn't be that hard. But if I get to the end here and I add another strip and I just keep sewing, and the more you do this, the more this your common sense will kick in because you'll know where you're headed and what you need. Right now, you don't really know where you're headed or what you need. You're kind of going um, um, in the fog. So here you can see how I stopped, maybe with a color or a size, and then here I'm picking up again. Or maybe I need them to be the same. It, you know, it really doesn't matter. Um, you can come in and cut. So sometimes I may have four or five of these 40 inch strips that have just kind of fallen off the back of my machine. So I will go in and separate those into the 40 inch, cut them wherever I stopped and started. But you can also take this strip. If one, two, three, four, five, six is too many and you're getting tangled, then just come in and separate them wherever. And then you have, you know, less pieces to work with and it might be a little bit easier. Um, for whatever reason. Can you show the fan folding again? Yes, sh show the fan folding again, certainly. This is really important. Okay, so let me grab, I think I have a wonderful little piece right here that we can use as our sample. Okay, so whether I need it for side four or for side three and four, so it has to be whatever this is, and it just so happens we're working with three inch. So our strip has to be three inches, but I like to make them just a little bit longer so that I can just slap it down and sew it on, okay? So start with the raw edges at the top and have your fold at the bottom. And you can even do multiples. And see here how you can go in and use different colors, but put your, um, your selvage or your raw edges at the top and your fold at the bottom. Okay. okay. Now, if you put it across here where you're going to sew it, I guarantee you, you're going to make it at least an inch too long. Do not measure here on the raw sides where you're, you're going to sew it. Do here because that way you can actually see the cut edge to the cut edge. You can see the true three inches because here is two and a half because I have a fourth of an inch here and a fourth of an inch here. So I want just a little bit more on this inch because it's the raw edge. And I need just a little smidge here from the, from the square to where my finger is. So I have this little magic mark 
and I just lay it down in my hand, okay? And then I'm gonna bring it up and fold it. Now this next one does not have to be as long because this is the selvage edge. So see this one, as I build, depending on however long my strip is, if it scraps, I, you know, you're only gonna get two or three folds. But if you're working with the, the, the full 40 to 45 inches from selvage to selvage, you know, then you're gonna have multiples. And also depending on this, you know, if this is four inches, then these are gonna be a little bit longer. And then see how you can just bring it down. And even though these are different sizes, I'm not gonna worry about it. Don't worry about it. Okay, now a three inch works pretty good on a selvage to selvage. You don't have, um, it goes down to the end. But um, if this one only went, let's play like that, it just went halfway, I'm not gonna cut that one. Because see how when I cut these at the top and the bottom, this one will open up and it will be uh, big enough to go on there. So, and then you would just cut at the top, cut here, and you're ready to go with your little short pieces on the side. Okay, any more questions on basic square? Uh, what about steam on your pressing? Okay, we're going to get into, um, um, I'm not sure how in-depth I'm going to get on, on uh, pressing during these option overviews, but I will tell you I do not use any steam. I do not use any um, starch. If I'm going to use steam or starch, well, first of all, when, you're, um, when you have your fabric out and you're cutting it, it needs to be pressed. And if you want to starch it, starch it then. Just you know, spray it, press it, get all the wrinkles out. But when you're here at the basic square, if you feel like you have to use some steam or starch, then you can do it. But once we start trimming it and cutting it and sewing it into the blocks, no steam, no starch. And in a Premium Club, I have a little science um, experiment I'm gonna show you on pressing. I'm gonna have a little star block over here that we're gonna steam and starch and press. And you're gonna see that thing curl up like a spider that you've hit with hot shot. And then I'm gonna show you one that you use with just a dry, hot iron, okay? All right, so any more questions before we start cutting? I think so. Okay. Are you having fun yet? What are you learning? Let us know what you're learning, what's new to you, what, what's been impressed upon your mind. Okay, so where are my pieces? Okay, so this is the very first thing that we need to do. So this is your option one right here. So we have our basic square. It's not trimmed, it's just a basic square. It can grow up and be flying geese. It can be a square and a square. It can be half square triangles. It can be any of the options one through 17. But for option one, the very first one, we want to trim leaving a fourth of an inch off of all four of these corners of our center square. Remember, everything revolves around the center square. And when you get to your piecing, uh, let's say you get this all trimmed up and it's not the size you want it to be, you have to go back and check three things. And I always look at the back of a block. And if you don't have one of these little one by six omni grids, I think we have a couple on the website, but you need to find them and you need to go get them and use this all the time at your cutting and at your sewing machine. So if the size, there's three things to check if your size is not what you want it to be. Check your center square, make sure it is truly what it needs to be. Check your seam allowance, make sure it is a, a scant, that means a thread or a hair. And on Premium Club and Quilt Club Week, we have um, a whole video on the seam and sewing and that scant. And then you need to look at the way that you trim it with your ruler to make sure that you're trimming it correctly. Now, one of the things that I love is, is that when you come in here with the trim, so let's say we have 30 of these that we're making for a quilt, and you can use any of the rulers today. You can use the original, you can use the mini or the grande. Now, um, I like the mini in this environment because it's small and it's um, pretty easy to work with in a smaller environment like this but probably most of you have the, the original, and so I'm going to work with it. So one of the things I love, let's say that you're making 30 of these for a quilt that you're doing, um, and especially at the beginning when you're new to all of this, trim one. So you'll have to, go, we'll show you how to trim it, but you would go in here and trim it, all four corners, trim one, 
and measure it to make sure that it's going to be the size that you want it to be. Because if it's a little bit small, then see this 90, you can push it out. And if you do it just a thread on all four corners, you're gonna add some to your block and still not lose anything that's important, that's of value. If it's too big, then you know that you can pull it back in a little bit and make it just a hair bit smaller and so therefore they'll, they'll fit in your block better. So that's a good way to test, make, cut one, measure it, make sure it's the way you want it. And if it is, keep going. And if it's not, then you know on the other 29, you need to push it out or bring it in. Now the cool thing about what we're doing today uh, and in these three classes for our option overview book is we don't really have to worry about size because these are all just going in our book. So it's a great way to learn and practice and all that. Okay, so here on your ruler, here is the 90 right here. If you're looking to where you can read it, go to the right, you'll see the 90. Now for those of you that need a quick um, geometry lesson, these two lines coming together and touch, that's the 90 because they touch and it's a 90 degree arc that's in here. And that's what um, a square is or a rectangle. Those are all 90 degree angles. So we want one set. So one set means two that are the same. Uh, on these seams and we want that 90 right in the tip. So put the 90 in there and push it into that corner, snug it up, snug it up tight in there. Okay, hand flat. Learn to cut flat. Don't cut like a spider. When you're cutting like a spider, this, then you have different pressure points on all four fingers. Your rulers can kind of slide around. Now you want them to be able to maneuver so don't go crazy and start putting a lot of sticky stuff on here. Um, but you also want it to be um, stationary when you're cut. So hand flat, put most of that weight here at the back or the palm or the heel of your hand, fingers lightly on it, okay? Make your cut. And there's your perfect fourth of an inch right there. So then you go around. So when you make your first cut, if it is not lining up in here exactly perfect, then go choose another one. You have four places that you can start. It really doesn't matter if you start here, here, or here. Now, sometimes in a pattern, it's particular to start in a certain place, but your pattern always gives you a warning. That's rare. So it's like, put your best foot forward. Start with the best corner. If it doesn't line up the way you want it to in that corner, then switch and go to another because once you start that very first cut, you have to keep it square. You have to keep these 90s true as you're cutting. So start with the best, with the one that you like the best. Don't go crazy with it. Okay, now this one here is kind of a good example. Um, I think you can see it, but if you, um, I can see it well on the monitor, but it, can you zoom in a little bit for us? Okay, and I wanna point something out. Okay, so here I have my 90 in the corner. I have my black lines over the seam. But see this grid line? It's not going exactly through that point. So, what do you line up? What do you do? Do you try to adjust it like that so it is perfect through there? If you do, then this outside edge starts getting at an angle and you lose that 90. That's why it's important to start with the best corner. So let's go back and look at this one and see. Okay, so it was in the tip, it lined up, and it went through the, the corner. So I started with a good one. So one of those seams, either the square was off a little bit, either the square was off a little bit, or your seams were off a little bit. When I'm looking at this one, this one here looks a little skinnier. This one here looks a little wider. So that means this square in here, if I went in here and measured it, it would be a little bit of a rectangle. It wouldn't have all four sides be exactly the same. But that's part of the great thing about the forgiveness. If you were doing traditional piecing, this would turn into an issue and it would just multiply as you continued on through the, the block or the quilt. But with the system, this is part of the beauty of it. It kind of erases all of those little imperfections and it keeps it, um, keeps it good. So put the 90 in the tip, line it up. Don't worry about this one. Since I've already made a cut, I have to keep it even. So my lines that are parallel and vertical, they're on here so that you can tell if your block underneath is staying 
true and staying flush or even or square or 90, however you want to word it. So make your cut and keep going. So now when I come in here, I put on this third one, I put my 90 in, I look at my lines, I look at my grid, and then I look out here. And I've got to keep it nice and even, nice and even. Now the size of your center squares and all of that is what determines the size of your block, the size of the center and the, the width of your streams and of course the way you trim it up. That's where the human element is. But all of this sizing can change, so that determines how this spreads out underneath the ruler. So if you're looking at the black line and the fabric and saying, oh, they're not lining up perfectly, that's okay. Don't worry about that. Worry about your fourth of an inch. Worry about keeping it square, okay? Because if I change my center square, this is going to change where it lines up with the ruler, with the lines. If I had a line everywhere that was possible, the ruler would be totally black and you couldn't see through it. And just keep going around in the tip. Got to keep that seam allowance correct and keep it square. And there I go. Now, you'll notice that your corners are slightly blunted, and that's okay. If they're too blunted, then that means your square was too big, your strips were too little, or your seams were too big. So once again, go back and check the cutting, the sewing, and of course the pressing, because when you press, when you press, let's go over here to the iron real quick. When you come in here and press, so see your heat is right here in the middle. Now these fibers, I'm going to say, are, are alive. They once were alive. So just like your, your fiber in your hand, if you feel heat, you're going to move away from it. So these fibers feel the heat in the middle, so the rest of this is starting to move away from it. So you can distort stuff. Um, with your pressing. You need to be careful. And when we teach different blocks and quilts, we go into um, move uh, the pressing on every block and how and when uh, to do that. And I think the pressing that we teach in the Premium Club and Quilt Club Week is really a great thing to help people get more perfection. Any questions? Can you mention about you, the scant quarter of inch video for the new uh, Premium students? Uh, it was very helpful to me. The um, scant um, seam allowance video, I, when, if you go into Premium Club, I think it's in the beginner section or the technique section, maybe both. Sometimes we load them in multiple places. So go in there and find the module that says beginners, and then when you click on it and open it up, there'll be a lot of different it's videos. Beginner for sure. So Steve said for sure in the beginner, and then also in the techniques uh, section, um, check on it. Quilt Club Week, now that we've had 2020, 2021, and 22, and we've been working on 23 all year, so I know it's not in 23. I'm pretty sure it would be in Quilt Club Week 1 or 2, and we maybe loaded it in multiple areas in Quilt Club Week, okay? All right, so now let's look at our charts, and let's do some sizing on there, okay? Now, when we talk about sizing, there's two size, there's two size numbers that people need to think about. Now the quilt world uses finished and unfinished, but I don't like those words because when you see this block, this option one, you could say it's finished. This is a finished option one, but it is not a finished size because it still has a raw edge on it, which makes it a cut size, which makes it larger, okay? So I like to use the word um, sewn or cut. So let's look at what sewn actually means. Sewn is the smaller number that people use in the quilt world. So let's say you have just a plain square. You could have a two inch sewn, and when you cut it, it would be two and a half, okay? So sewn is, let's say, two inches. Finished would be two inches. Or if you're working with graph paper, it would be two inches. All of those numbers would be the same, and it would be the smaller. Now, when you're working with the larger number, that is the cut. See how this has a cut edge? It's the raw edge. 
like you have a raw edge or it's unfinished. You know, it's just laying here unfinished. It's waiting to go into the quilt. Now, in your reference book on page 37 is where we have this information for you to see and, and, um, and for you to help learn. To me, this is the most important thing out of everything that you're going to learn in these option classes. You've got to learn the sewn finished and graph paper and know when to use it. And you have to learn the cut, the raw, or the unfinished and know when to use it. When you're building a quilt from scratch, you've got to work with this smaller number, the sewn size. So if you'll go, if you have your reference book, let's go to page 34. And that's where your charts start. So each option has its own little chart. So this one uh, for option one would be here on page 34. Now, I'm not sure how much you can zoom in and I'll move my book, but I would like for them to try to look at the top. Okay, now if you notice on the charts, there's three columns. The first, for up here at the very top, is gonna tell you what option it is. Then in this column, since this is an option one, this is an option one. So this very first column is talking about the size of the option one, because you're gonna be like, oh, I have a five inch charm, it's a cut size, and I want a five inch cut option one to go next to it. So if it's a five inch cut, then you have to move down to the sewn, which would be four and a half. And see right here at the very top of this, it says sewn or finished. So that would be a four and a half option one, that would be a cut five that you're gonna to sew to the charm. So I would come down here and find my four and a half. And then the next column is going to tell you what size to cut the center square. And the last column is gonna tell you what size to cut the strips. So let's say that you have a five inch charm pack then you can, and it's a cut size, you could come in here and look and find the five inch and say, okay, that would turn into a so-and-so option one. Or if you have option four half square triangles, you could say, okay, the cut, this one is the cut center square. There's my five. Oh, that's going to make that size of half square triangle. Okay, that's great. So the charts will help you learn how to use pre-cuts and what you can make with them. Um, flying geese. Um, you know, uh, if you have a five inch charm, it's gonna make a unusual size. So the charts have what, um, have fourth of an inch increments. So you can make any size that you want of any of these options, you know, just by the size of the square and the size of the strip. It's unlimited on the size that you can make, how small, how big, anything in between. But that doesn't mean that every size of center square makes uh, option one or whatever option it is that is um, what I call a, a, a most common size. So we don't do anything smaller than an eighth of an inch. So anything that is one eighth, three eighths, five eighths, seven eighths, that's as small as we go. You can do different, but we don't put them in the charts because you really need to be a perfectionist to do measurements that are smaller than an eighth and be very comfortable with your cutting and your sewing and all that. It's not the average quilter, so we don't put that in our book of smaller. But let's say that you needed a three inch option one. Uh, let's say that you needed an unusual num size of an option one. Um, so smaller than an eighth would be a sixteenth. So you need something that's a sixteenth or a thirty second or a sixty fourth. Go to the chart for the size that's closest and then either work up or down when you're figuring that center square. Now that's, that's a lot of info for a beginning class like this, but there's probably one person out there that was thinking about that and would have asked me. So, okay, do we have a question? Uh, you mentioned graph paper. Mm -hmm. How do you use the graph paper? Um, so, some, when I was first getting started and I was learning everything about quilting even before square and a square, I learned graph paper. So you can go down to like any office supply place or look online or whatever, and you can get graph paper. There's eighth of an inch graph paper. There's fourth of an inch graph paper. There's some that's that's made for quilters. That's really handy. Um, and I do have those. Um, most of the time you're gonna buy them that's book size, which is means it's like eight and a eight and something by 11 and something. So if you want a 12 inch block, you can't fit it on there. So 
it's nice to be able to have those graph papers so that you can actually work with a 12 inch block of 14 or 16 or whatever. So, um, so graph paper is going to be gridded. So let's say that this is a, is that green showing up a little bit? Okay, let me use a different one. Let's say that this is my graph paper and it's a fourth of an inch graph paper. That means every fourth of an inch there's going to be a horizontal line and there's going to be a vertical line. Just like kind of the way fabric is, is woven. There's the vertical and the horizontal. But then this is on paper and it's a graph paper. So um, if this is fourth of an inch, then one, two, three, four is a square. So one, two, three, four. Now, if we didn't have the charts, so let's say this is a one inch. So if this is a one inch on the grid, both all of these are a fourth of an inch. So that makes one and all of these are a fourth of an inch and that makes one. Now our, our um, spring class in premium club last semester, we worked on learning the grids and then making a quilt and learning how that anything can go inside those squares or rectangles. So this is really kind of another class, but with the charts, you don't have to go back to the graph paper. If we didn't have the charts in the book, then you would have to go back to the graph paper. So the charts are once again, kind of a microwave version of getting to where you need to go quicker without having to draw it out on paper. But anytime I'm trying to figure out colors and placement or help with any of that, I do go back and draw it out on paper, whether I just do it on scratch paper like I'm working with here or actual graph paper. Uh, like a five inch charm, I didn't see that on the chart. Can you explain how? Okay, if you have a five inch charm, and you want to make an option one, it's going to be a weird size because it's not on the chart. So, um, uh, well, if she has a five inch charm, she's trying to use a five inch charm. She's not trying to get a certain size. So, um, in between the, um, so it's going to be between a six and an eight inch option one because I'm looking on this middle column where the cut center square is. So your cut center square is a five inch charm. So the five inch center square is great with the pre-cuts and the two and a half inch jelly rolls are great to go with that five inch. So those are two pre-cuts you can use to get an option one, but it's gonna be an unusual measurement uh, because it's gonna be between a six and an eight inch option one. So you could um, either use that five inch in the center and draw it out on graph paper or just make one up and see what it turns out to be. But it's going to be um, between the six and eight. So if you go to, if you have the book and you're looking at the chart on page 34, go to the middle column and look uh, for the center squares. You have a four and three fourths and a six and an eighth. So see that five would be in between there. When you look on the other numbers, it says that's gonna be a six inch between a six inch and an eight inch option one. So your option one's gonna be in between there. It's probably gonna be like um, a seven and a fourth or something like that. See how that's a weird measurement? You know, where would you need a seven and a fourth inch option one? Now, if you're just using these by yourself, then you can just build whatever, but the likelihood of needing that in a pattern is not gonna happen. On the five inch, uh, how do you know the strip size? Okay, when you go to your book, uh, where your option one is on um, and the basic square, there is a little magic math formula. So on page 15 here, when you go down here to the bottom, there's a magic math. So this is gonna help you with knowing, knowing that size and strip ratio for your, for your square, but you really don't need to know that. If you just come over here to the charts, it's going to have that already figured for you. If you know you have a certain center square, it's going to tell you the size of the strips. But basically, it's the cut size. So we had a cut size here of three inches divided in half. That's one and a half. 
and then you add a fourth one and three-fourths and that's the size of strips that you covered on here. So see when you think about it, it's got to come in and cover at least half of your square and have a seam allowance on there. So it's half plus a fourth. Now anytime I'm sewing, sometimes you can have multiple sizes of squares and strips when you're working on a pattern and they can get kind of um, over um, messed up. You maybe pick up a one and a fourth when you should have picked up one and a half. If they're not overlapping when you're doing the sewing process, then you know your strip. You've picked up either the wrong square or the wrong strip. Okay. All right. Any other question? I don't think so. Okay. Let's look at a couple of quilts that use um, the option ones so that you can start looking for them in quilts. So this one right here, this one is out of the reference book. And you can see here how we had the black center squares with the orange. And I think we did 35 of these. I think there's five in a row and seven rows. So there's 35. But look, here's the option one. So see, there's the option one right there. And we did just a little sashing in between. Another option one, another option one, and so on. Now, let's look at this one. Let me. Now, this one is the big Christmas tree, and the big Christmas tree is found in, can you zoom out on that, Any? No? no? Need to go the okay, well, I'll show it overall here in just a minute. Um, and we'll, hang, we'll hang it up so that you can see all of it. But I want you to look at the option ones. So all of these are just option ones. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so when you see, these are all option ones. So we had a light center square with green, we had a dark center square with red, and then those colors um, just alternate. But look here on the end how we have this. If we can keep it as option ones, then we don't have to change any of our cutting for our centers and our strips. If we did that as a flying goose on the end, then you have to go in and change the size of your centers and your strips. So if we can do it as an option one, it's going to make it much easier. So you see that seam right there and right there? There's a seam right there and right there. So this is an option one. We had the light square in the middle. We put red on two sides. We put the light on the other two sides. So that way it made it easier in the cutting and the sewing and the pressing by just making all of these option ones. Now let's look at a couple of other. So see this one here was a center square with red and light. Look at this one, center square, red and light. See it's the same, it's the same. Now look at this one. We did the green in the middle. We did the same green on two sides. You could kind of spice it up and do a different green to make it look more like the different shades of green in a Christmas tree. And then we did two reds on this side. But see, all of these are option ones. This one has the red up, the red down, the red up. So all of these are option ones. And they're all stacked right on top of each other. Now, no, see how these seams, they, they match up. This option one is stacked up with this one and this one. They're all sewn in rows. And when the rows go together, we make sure they stack up perfectly on top. Now this next one, I'm going to show you this one up here because this one is just like the Christmas tree, all option ones and different colors. But when we sew them together, we stagger them like bricks in a wall. And that way you get this kind of chevron look or the uh, tumbling block look. So a tumbling block quilt doesn't have to be difficult. It's just option one. It's just option one. But when the rows are sewn together, they're sewn um, so that the seam is in the middle. So let's look at that on paper and then we'll come back and look at that again. So we're going to play like these squares are all option ones and see how they're all sewn together in a row, just like on the Christmas tree. But then when we do the next row, See how this seam goes through the middle of the one above it and below it. See, it's all option ones sewn together in rows, but we just stagger them. So, of course, here on the end is going to be a rectangle, and we're going to do something different, but that's not today's class. 
to finish those rows out so they're even. So let's look back up here again at this one. And you can see the tumbling blocks. Okay. And I'm going to put the Christmas tree right here and we can zoom in on it. So while you're here with this one, I want you to see. So see, here's your option ones, all sewn in rows. And see this seam? See how it goes through the center of that black square below it? So that's the center of the option one. And then when you do that, the connection of the colors. And the, con the colors on this one are the most important, but I think there's only four different option ones with, with different color combos on them. Um, so we've let the fabric kind of do the work of uh, changing a lot of those colors with some of the kind of ombre or batik type colors. Okay, so now let's look at the Christmas tree. The overall of it. Now this large pattern is a, I think it's a free pattern on our website. You can go in and download it. There's, I don't know, two to eight patterns or so that you can download. I don't know how many there are right now. And see, all of these are option ones, just your color variation. Okay, so now let's look at this one. This one is called the uh, Double Star. It's an individual pattern that you can get. This is some of our newer fabrics, and we also have kits for it. And we'll talk about the Flying Goose to make the star next class. But I want you to see the big option one right here, the big option one. See how we've used it as a setting square? So we have our star, option one, star, option one, and so on. And then notice how the purple comes together to make those points of that star. So it's a double star. You have the little star inside with the bigger star circling it and surrounding it. Okay, let's look down here at our table. We have a little Christmas tree, and the little Christmas tree is in your uh, mini ruler book. So all the rulers come with little books, and the quilts that are in there are all different. And the mini ruler's not just for mini quilts. I use it the majority of the time just for convenience of the size. But here's the little Christmas tree. You can see my hand is here. So it's about the size of four hands. And one of our new, new members in Premium Club, she, I saw pictures of a little Christmas tree that she was working on. So she's a newbie and she's coming right along with our little Christmas tree. Great way to use up scraps. And then this one here, I'm pretty sure this one is in the reference book. And it's one of my favorites. I've had this quilt for probably 35 years. Here's a great one where you can see the scraps that we've used. And so here in the middle, let's look at our option one. Instead of a plain square in the middle, see how we have an option one, our square in the middle, and then the different colors on the side. And then that was our center of the star, and it gives the star just a little bit more flavor and depth by using an option one instead of just a plain square in the middle. Okay. okay, so now everything you've learned, we're just going to go one step farther with, and we're going to do what we call an option eight. So for the option eight, of course, you start out with your basic square. You trim it, leaving the fourth of an inch. So see how the DNA is passed from the mother is going to be passed to the very first um, child. And this is the option eight. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our ruler, and I'm just going to go from tip to tip diagonally. I'm going to look at my grid lines to make sure I'm staying square. And I'm going to do this. And this. Now, if I was doing this for real, I would know what size my square was. And I would make sure that I was going exactly through there using the grids on my ruler. So basic square, trim leaving a fourth on all four corners, cut diagonally tip to tip 
when you're doing it for real, make sure that you're using the grids on the ruler to make sure that you're right through the middle of your square both times when you cut. And then when you separate them out, there's your option eight. This is option eight. And you're thinking, great, what can I do with an option eight? You can flip them like this. And you plain square in the middle, a nine patch, an option one, anything can go there in the middle. You know how hard it is to make a square and put two triangles using the short side on there, keeping it square and nice and neat and having that perfect fourth of an inch with enough fabric in that seam. This is a difficult, is difficult to do in the traditional quilt world. But now I want you to look at borders. Now, sometimes an option one can do the same border that this is doing. So you have to think about color placement and where you want your colors to be and where you want your seams to be. So there's your border and you're thinking, okay, that's great. But now I have a mitered corner. If I wanted to make that border go up the other side, see how easy it is to go in and keep that border going up on the other sides. So this is really, really a great one for a cool border. So now let's look at our book. And let's look at our charts. So when you look at this option eight, this is a square, okay? And when we're figuring our sizing for an option eight, this is what you need to know. So, um, when you go to your option eight in your book, let me grab one of these little squares. So it's on page 34. So when you look at your option eight, it's going to show you the unit and it has an X in it, an X right there. And the words, it says, what size do you want this to be? So once you know what size you want this to be, and remember it says sewn, the sewn size of X. So if this is a, a, a two inch, uh, let's say a two and a half cut right here, then it's gonna be a two inch sewn. So I would find it on my chart and I would move across and it says a five inch center. So here's your five inch. If you've got some five inch charms, you can make these little option eights and, and have a, a good size for them. Not all five inch centers make what I'm gonna call a healthy size, but a five inch charm on this makes a good healthy size, makes it makes that two inch sewn, two and a half cut, okay? Now, I wanna show you another chart. There's, when you're wanting to do this. And these charts are just, they get you to the sewing machine quicker. Okay, so let's say you're gonna do this and you need to know what size for here so that this fits here. So if you know what this is, going to be at the top of page 40. So it says using an option eight, and that's what this is, an option eight. It says as a corner unit on any center. It's a corner unit on any center. So it, the very first column here says your center block. What's your center block? It's got a sewn size and a cut size. So let's say that, um, that you have an eight inch here and it's sewn and it's going to be eight and a half cut. Just stay on that very bottom line and move across to the next section and it's going to tell you what size of square and what size of strips so that these snap onto here like Lego pieces. Okay, now you, let, this is a great one to use as graph paper. Okay, so let's play like I don't have my book or whatever. Let's just go back to the graph paper. Okay, so when I look at this, if I wanted this to be a block, and in grid class, we talked about this. We talked about one, two, three, four. So you're going to have four units going across that you need to be all the same size. So think about it as a grid. If you had all four of these going across, this one right here just happens to be this green triangle. And this happens to be the, the purple there. So I'm going to kind of draw it on out so that you can see it. And let's say these are going to be two inches sewn. So if it's two inches sewn, two inches sewn, two inches sewn, two inches sewn, that's going to get you an eight inch block. If I knew I needed an eight inch block, 
I would draw it out into the 4 and go back and do, okay, 4 into the 8 is 2, 2, 4, 6, 8, 8 inches sewn, 8 and a half cut. Learn to use your S's and your C's by your numbers so that when you go back and look at this number, you know, is that a sewn size or is that a cut size, okay? So that tells me that this is a um, 2 inch right here sewn. So then I could go back and use my chart and drop that in uh, to it, but there's also a magic math formula. So if that's a two inch sewn corner here and here, you're going to double it, which makes it four and add a half of an inch. So that means my center square for here is four and a half inches. Okay. Now this is a lot, but I want you to know it's available. You're not going to get all of this math today. What I want you to get today is I want you to understand the basic square and I want you to understand the trimming. And most of the time you're going to be following the, the patterns in the books, um, you know, so don't think, oh, I can't do that. Okay, so let's, let's look at our option one in your book. So you're going to put your, your basic square and your basic square and your option one. And then you're going to move forward to eight. So look at this one right here. See how you have a nine patch with a triangle on the side? What if you had a nine patch and you wanted to do the option eights on the side? See how cool that would be? Okay, so here's your option eights. You might, I would in my book, I would show the basic square. I would show the trimming of the option one. I would show one kind of exploded out like this. So see, that's three basic squares right there. And then I would show another one like I did here of how easy it is to do a border and do those mitered corner edges. So I would do something like that in my book. And in, put any notes on here that you need to remember. You know, everybody, um, you know, is going to have something that they need to remember that's different than somebody else. So um, make any notes in here that you need to do. Questions before we move on? Uh, we have a question on the double star that you showed up. Okay. Okay. Basically, how did you know to do the sizing from going to an option one to a star and all that? Well, that's a whole nother class on building an, a, um, a quilt, but basically you decide what size of star do I want. If I want a six inch star, then I know I have to have a six inch option one. And so the chart for the option one, that's just one thing. You go and look, but for this, you have to build it. Yes, and this, you can get an individual pattern for this on the double star. It goes from a 3-inch star all the way up to a 12-inch. So you can make them any size you want from that one pattern. Also, in your reference book, I think on page 79, there's um, a basic star. It might have that uh, option one in the middle like I showed here on the table. Um, what is the name of the quote with that option one on the table? Um, let me just look here in the book, in your reference book. I think it's on page 79, if I remember correctly. I think it might be Ohio Star. No, that's Prairie Claw on that one. Um, um, page 69, I was off, and it's called Ohio Star. And so I want you to look here at your book. So here's your pattern for your 6-inch, and it's going to tell you right here it's a 6-inch, so that's the same as this one right here and then when you turn the page of course it tells you how to complete it but then over here it tells you there's a three a four a five a six a seven a eight and a nine ten eleven twelve so it's got all of those sizes of stars in here it's going to tell you what size and estimated fabric amounts and it will tell you up here at the top that these estimated fabric amounts are for 12 blocks or eight blocks or however however many okay so this one here is Montana Star, and it's kind of a cool one um, if you wanted to do. See, this one here is just, um, I don't know if you can zoom in. I'll move wherever you're at for your zoom. 
Okay, so here you can see the, the quilt, but see it's just a plain solid square with an option one. Plain solid square, option one, and it's just all scrappy and just, you know, look how beautiful it, um, it is. So that's a nice, easy, simple one to do, Montana Star on page 66 if you're just getting started. That's a great one to do. All right, so some more questions. Uh, here's one on the screen. Okay. So, my eyes have been seeing square and square every time I see a quilt. You are sure right. Complicated quilts don't look as hard. That's right. Once you know that you can um, make them with the system, it's just super easy to do. Okay, so this is an option 11. It's one of my most favorite options. This is our new Paradise fabric. Look how beautiful it is. Um, the purple flower, the orange bird, the lime green. I'm, I'm loving it, loving it. Okay, so let's look at what we're going to do to make an option 11. This is our option 11. This is the completed unit. Notice how it has a plain square, just like our little option 8. See when they were finished, see how they have just a plain square, and, um, and the trimming and stuff is the same. So you can see how that DNA is passed down from the option one from the mother and it goes forward. Okay, so start out with your basic square. Trim it like an option one, leaving that fourth of an inch on all of the corners. Then you're gonna go in and sew around it again. So this becomes your square, just like this was your square and you sew it to strips. Now this is your square and you're gonna sew it to a strip. So your block is growing, so your st strips have to grow in width and in length. And see how when you get it trimmed up, you're just going to put it on there like that. Finger space in between. Put another one for however many you need. Do side one, side two, side three, side four, just like we did with the basic square. And you wind up with new strips on all four sides. Okay? Now this one, we need to, when we look at our, our block, so let's look at our block here. So, of course, the first time we trimmed, we trimmed like an option one. We sew around it again. And now this time when we trim, we need to do a new trim that you haven't learned yet. See how sharp that point is? See how sharp those points are? There is not a fourth of an inch off of this corner, just like, see, this one has a fourth of an inch? But see how these do not have a fourth of an inch. They're trimmed up sharp. Okay? So, um... I'm going to show you how to place the ruler on here, but I'm not going to trim it because I only have one of those, okay? So when you look at your ruler, let's put it here on the white so you can see it really good. And let's zoom down as much as we can. Okay, so the first time you've trimmed, you've used the 90 and see how it's left a fourth of an inch off of your, your point. So you can see that right there just like that, how we put it right in the tip and trimmed it and left the fourth. So now we're going to move over two lines. We're going to put the 90 in our middle and then we're going to step it two lines. We call it the two-step. We're in Texas, so the Texas two-step helps you remember it. So you're going to go one, two, and you want the end or the tip of that line right here where it falls off the edge of the ruler. You want that to be in the corner of your block. And see when you go to that tip, see how you have this new grid line right here that shoots through that point. So, put your 90 in, just like you're used to doing, and then we're going to step it, or slide it one. See how we're dragging it down into the block? There's one, and there's two. So, the line is on the seam, and you want the, the edge of the ruler right to be nice and sharp, right in that point, because you need a sharp point right there, no fourth of an inch. Now, when you come back to that point, is. Now, it is really important once you start going around your block multiple times and you start cutting it up into multiple pieces, then it's really important that you keep your block square and that everything lines up just as, as perfect as you can. So then you will make your cut and see how you're going to get that nice sharp point. And then you would turn it and do the next one and the next one and the next one and keep it square as you go around just like we've we've said from the beginning so then when you come in here to cut 
you're going to cut right through these sharp points. So I'm going to lay the ruler through these sharp points. I'm going to look at the outside to see if I'm staying nice and square. And I'm going to look at any of my grid lines inside to see how I'm doing. I'll make my cut, then be very careful for it not to wiggle, and come in here and make your cut the opposite direction. And then you get those, those four. These are option 11s. You get those four. When you look at your charts in your book, it's going to say, what is the size of this right here you need? So let's say that I wanted this to be a four inch. If I wanted one option 11 to be a four inch, and you have to work in those sewn numbers, the smaller number, then this would be a two and this would be a two, two inch, two inch. So this, the X there would be a two inch sewn. So then I just go to my book, I find my option 11 chart, probably page 35, yep. And it says the X, what is this X that you're looking for? I come in here and find the two inches and then I move across and it tells me the size of my center square the size of my, um, tells me the size of my center square, the width of my first row of strips, and the width of the last. And on here, if I did want a two inch sewn for this one, I would start out with a five inch cut center. So once again, there's your five inch charm. We'll make a four inch sewn, option 11. Let's look at um, a couple of quilts, or one quilt. Can you do the Texas two-step showing it under white paper? Yes. Okay. Let's look at it here again. And maybe put your stuff on. Okay, so zoom down. Let's look again. Okay. So normally you have this 90 right here that you're going to put in that corner and see how it's going to leave that fourth of an inch right there? So you're going to put the 90 in there to kind of get your bearings as to where you're at, and you're going to slide it. And when you slide it, you're going to go one, two, and you're going to put that right there, the tip of that line right there in the tip of your square. This is going to line up with your seam, and when you go back to the tip, see how this grid line here will go through the center. So let's see if we can see it maybe better on this one. So here's your 90 in there, and see how that's going to leave the fourth of an inch. Yeah, zoom in. Yeah, that's a pretty good shot. Okay, so we're going to drag it down into the square. So we're step it over one, two. And when you move it over two, you make sure it's snugged up in that corner really nice. And it goes down that seam. And then when you go back to that point, you have a grid line that goes through to the end. And that is the Texas two-step. So out of the things that you've learned today, the three most important things that I want you to remember is how to make this basic square and all the tips and hints, how to trim leaving the fourth of an inch, and how to do the two-step. If you understand those three things, you can jump in here and start making everything. You don't have to learn how to read the charts. You don't have to do all of the, I'm just doing as much as I can for each one to help you. Um, there's lots of patterns and charts in there to keep you going. So three things to remember. How to sew the basic square, how to trim leaving a fourth, and how to trim doing the two-step. And if you do, if you know those, you're ready to rock and roll. You are ready. Your future for quilting is bright and wide open, ready to go. Okay, so let's look at, um, uh, where is that? Oh, the, the option 11 quilt is down underneath. So we'll just go ahead and look at a couple of these as we go. So in this one right here, in the Premium Club and also in Quilt Club Week this year, we have some great classes on Storm at Sea. Storm at Sea was always a quilt I looked at and admired, but I thought it's a difficult one to do. You're going to have to do paper piecing. You're going to have to do Y seams, set in pieces. But with the square and a square system, the Storm at Sea becomes just as simple and easy as possible as ever. And we have a lot of different quilts that use this grid structure. So when you look at it, here is the option one. Do you see that option? one, the orange center, the yellow strips, and then this is the option seven, and those repeat. 
and then this option seven goes this way and this is an option two we're going to learn option two uh, the last week of september and this is option two so option one two and seven and you have your storm at sea this one right here is the same grid format of a storm at sea you have your bigger square here which is a double four patch which was our option two here you have the same vertical and horizontal option seven diamonds and you have the same option one so these two are exactly the same, but inside the grids, you just did something a little different. And this one is in the diamond book. And your storm at sea is actually at the back of your reference one, your very beginning book. I love it when a quilt's gotten washed a couple of times and they just get so soft and cozy. Okay. Now this one right here is the option 11. So this beautiful quilt right here uses option one, option 11. So everything you learned today, this quilt is now at your fingertips. You can make it. And if you have your book, this is even the sample that we use on uh, pattern adapting and figuring fabric and all of that here in your in your book. So uh, let's kind of zoom down here for just a minute. And okay, so this is on page 43 in your reference book. This is the traditional pattern right here. Look at all of these, all of these separations in this block. This is how they want you to cut your pieces and put it together. It's just crazy. You, you would look at this and it would be an unfinished project in a box under your bed. It, it's just would never get finished. Now when we look at it, we're going to break it down into options. So here's the option 11 in the corner. And here's the option 1, option 11, option 1, plain square, 1, and then 11's in the corner. So we would do, uh, let's see what our corners do. Corners go go in okay so basically here's your 11 just exploded out and of course our sizings are not correct but you're going to have option 11 option 1 option 11 and that's going to repeat down here at the bottom and those are going to go in between with a plain square right here so this right here what we've learned today you can do this so let's look at that. Let's break the block down and look at it. Is this a good place for you to go, Steve? Okay. Okay, let me see what you're looking at here. Okay, so here is your option 11. Here's your option 1, option 11. Option 1, plain square, option 1. And then at the top, this is the same as your bottom, an 11, a 1, and an 11. And then when you put the blocks together, see how this weaving goes through here. And it's just really beautiful. This was from my Pony Express fabric of about 15 years ago now on that one. Okay, questions while I get the next one out. So once you learn this beginning and just keep building on it, it's just really super amazing. So this is our last one, option 11. 13. I'm sorry, 13. Last one, option 13. So let's zoom out. Now this one had the basic square, which we, you know, um, took some time on and then it had four options. So you learned a lot today. Our other options will um, like next week We just have option 3 9 and 15 and um, We won't go over the basic square. So it'll go a little bit faster. Once again, these are the paradise fabrics You can see how beautiful they are Okay, so this is our option 13 right here this is the option 13. You can see how it has that plain square in the middle right here, just like 
we talked about with 11 and 8. So when you use your chart, once again, you just have to know this plain square right here. And then you can go in and start from the very beginning and build them out. Okay? All right. Basic square. Trim leaving a fourth of an inch. Sew around it again. Trim leaving a fourth of an inch. So this was the option one and option eight. This is the option 11. And so now we're going to take this and just move forward. We're going to sew strips on again. So just like we did before, this is now our center square and we're sewing strips on. It looks like this when you get all four sides. Now when we come back and look, we're going to leave a fourth of an inch, just like we did on the very beginning. And you can see that fourth of an inch here. So basically, if you're going to be cutting through that point, so see here, we're going to be cutting through that point, you need to do the two-step. If you're cutting through that point either now or later. So see on this 13, we're not cutting through here now, but this is this and we're cutting through it later. So when you look at your book, this quick trim now is, would be pretty important to you um, that I tried to talk about earlier. So when you come to your, to your page that tells you about option 13, it's going to have the quick tip and it says trim like an option one. So here we did trim like an option one, trim like, uh, whoops, I have those. Well, nope, I had them right trim like an option four that means sharp do the two step and then it says trim like an option one so that tells me i'm going to sew around it one two three times because i have three trimmings and it tells me one two step one and then when you come in here and cut it you're going to cut it like an x just like we did before you're going to come in here and go tip to tip so on your ruler, you can see this fourth of an inch line on your ruler. Let's zoom down in here and I'll put the white underneath it so you can see. So see on your ruler, you have these fourth of an inch lines that go around three sides. Now the one down here at the bottom is an eighth, so don't get confused. But when you're cutting these up, see how these need to match up with your points and you know you have a fourth of an inch there for the, the seam. So let's look at how we would cut that. So I'm putting the ruler through the tip, through the tip, and then I'm coming in here and looking at my fourth of an inch line. Is it right there at the point of that one? And do I have enough from the point to my cut on this other one? So that I can get my, my um, fourth of an inch here, like you see. So I would just come in and cut and cut. So here you can see cut. Whoops, zoom out a little bit. So cut and cut both directions and you have your four. So once again, just like with our option eight, look how these could go on the outside. It's like you have an instant block. You have all this beautiful piecing and color going on. And you know, you could put a plain square in the middle, do a nine patch, do a, a star, do a little star in here. I mean, it's just endless. Um, Take any block and put these on the corners and expand your block. So that's option 13. Of course, the X works on the chart, just like we talked about with 8 and 11. All right. And then let's look at in our books. You can show as many steps as you want in your, in your books. That was one of the questions. What should we put in the book? Yeah. Let's just kind of look through our... Um, and my books are going to vary a little bit each book, and it depends on how much sewing you want, how much you want in there. So uh, basic square, option one. Um, on this one, I just have the option eight going like this, but in the other one, you saw where I put them to where it looked like they would be on the outside of a block. And then for 11, um, you can do as many of the steps as you want. Make as many notes as you want. And then 13, here's 13. It's fun to see it in just other colors. So light, dark, light, print, and then your, your block cut like an X. You know, you maybe want to put your quick trim points. So do like one, two step, one, 
you know, whatever your quick tips are. And then here's 13 going like a border. We didn't look at that as a border, but wow, 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 wouldn't that be pretty? So I don't have any um, showing a 13. It's really beautiful, and for some reason, I just have not done a lot with it. You know, when you think about it, I'm always teaching, you know, for almost 40 years, I was on the road, and so you're always teaching beginners, you know, to teach something with, you know, like when people say, oh, I want a six-hour class, not every quilt can you do in a six-hour class. You have to make sure that there's enough repetition of what they're learning that when class is over, they can go home and remember what they did. So most of the time, learning the basic square and then learning two options, like an option one and an option three, that was all we could do in a six-hour class. You know, I could teach more, but are you going to remember it? You know, is it going to be worth your time and mine to do that? But now that I have the premium club, and I can just keep taking people farther down the road and keep showing them more. That's how we have the Firefly option 44 and the Hen House 43 and the Snowball 41. It's because since 2019, I've been home more. I'm not on the road 300 days out of the year. And so, and I have a group of people that is following along and from the beginning and then ready for the, for the new stuff. So, um, you know, if I was just at your group for six hours, you know, today, we couldn't, we couldn't do everything that we did here today. Uh, even all of this, of learning the basic square, option one, option eight, option 11, and 13. You can't learn that with me in a six hour class. So this is a lot for you to learn today. You've got a week to really soak it up and just, you know, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, practice. That's one reason why I want you to make all 30 of these or more all at once because I want you to learn that repetition. I want you to do enough of them that you understand what everything that's happening in here. I, when I first started teaching this 45 years ago now, um, I was blown away with how much time I had to spend on just this alone. And in today, we spent about an hour just on the basic square alone. And so, um, because now we're doing this online, and we have all the technology available to us where that I'm not away from you. I'm still right there with you all the time that we can we can move on and do this. Question? Do you recommend to set up your book as families or by numbers of options? That's a good question. Um, I would probably say to if you spend a week on this um what's the thing about your brain if you um, spend 20 minutes a day doing yeah. yeah if you spend 20 minutes a day doing this learning it looking at your books watching the video you in a week you will have learned it you'll you'll know it well yeah you'll know it well the the thing goes if you do that for a year for if you do, if you spend 20 minutes a day for a year doing whatever it is you want to learn, you'll know more in that year than the expert that was teaching you. So spend 20 minutes a day. So all this week, spend 20 minutes watch, doing this, watching it over and over. Do you glue your? Yeah, just use a glue stick. Do you just put them in the sleeve loose? Some of mine are loose because in my teaching, I take them out and I show them, but some are glued in. I would say for you, you probably want to glue them all in. And then we've had multiple questions about the quote behind you. This one. That's okay. option 11. Mm -hmm. This is rolling. Is this is called Rolling Star. And there is an individual pattern on the website that you can get called Rolling Star. And it uses option 11 and option 1. So this was a great quilt for you to see what you've learned today how you can get this beautiful quilt. And normally you would look at this and say, oh, that's too much. Normally, okay, in the quilt world, they want you to do diamonds and Y seams and set in pieces right here. So this is a perfect example of, of what the traditional quilt world is gonna teach you and how we break it down so much more simple to just squares and strips and straight line sewing. Everybody that's watching today, 99.9 .9 .9 of you is going to come out with a perfect quilt if you just sit down and do it. And you can even break it down and make it smaller. I don't have the little tiny one here. Actually, Steve, if you could look in my teaching bag right over there, that turquoise one, there's a little tiny option 11. And I'm going to show this one while you're doing that. Isn't that rolling star? 
Yeah, it's got green and purple in it. It's probably be right there to closest to you in the front of that turquoise bag. Oh, and this one's got borders in it. This one is the option 11 in borders. So this is the same block. It might even be the same size. I don't know. And this one, it may be a little bit easier for you to see the... Um, See the options because of the, the lightness of it, okay? And this is called Rolling Star. This is Rolling Star, and it's an individual pattern you can get on the website. It's not in any of the current books. If you have some old, old books, um, maybe the anniversary book. If you have an old, old book called the anniversary book, um, I think it's in that one. But otherwise, it's an individual pattern. Okay, so let's look at the block. Okay, so there's the block. So here in the corners, you see the option 11s. Here's the option 1. So see, when you look at it here, see the option 11, option 1, option 11. And then here is option 1s on each end with the eagle. This is all of our patriotic fabric. You can find it on the website. And then here's the top row right here. So see that option 11 right here. And here's the option 1. And there's the option, there's the option 11 right there. Now look at this border. This border is option 11. Look how cool that is. Mm -hmm. So here's your option 11 right there. And I think another thing that is f uh, good for you to do is to go in and kind of do, uh, do flashcards. Get some paper. Um, and write option 11 and draw the block on it and do that for the options that you use today and then stack them up together just like a little kid with flashcards with their multiplication tables and then you can be in the car you can be at your sewing machine and you can look at that option 11 and then um, have that square drawn on there so for your um, for your little flashcards draw these out when you draw these out it'll help you learn so let's put the camera down here please and let's so here's your option 11 option 11 you're going to have this this is your option 11 see these these are in the grid of my brain i know these So there's your option 11. So maybe you want to draw an option 11, put the number by it, and then just keep drawing them. You know, draw them, do 50 of them on a piece of scratch paper. And that would um, help, that would help you learn them. Because these, these seams and these grids, the, and these seams right here, these lines, that's what you need to know and learn so that when you start looking at quilts, you can see them. So on a piece of paper, just a scratch piece of paper, just keep drawing them, and that's going to help your brain learn them. You know, think back to preschool, kindergarten, first grade. What did they have you do? They just had you do a whole worksheet on AAA or squares or circles or whatever it is that they were teaching Be because they were trying to get this grid in your brain and that's what I'm trying to do is to get this grid in your brain where that you can see a square and you can see those seams inside because every time you have a seam you have a possibility for another color the more colors possibility you have the more stuff like this that you can do so this would be a square with one, two, three, four, five triangles on it. You know how hard it would be to make this unit just like this, just cutting out individual pieces and putting them together? It'd be really, really, really difficult to do. I'm loving all these oranges and purples and greens. Okay, so I'm going to show you this last little elo option 11 right here. And since it's on the table... Um, you'll be able to see it. Okay, so here is the option 11. It's just little. It's just like what we did up there. So,
there's the 11. You see that little, just like we were drawing. And then there's the option one. And there's the 11. So that top row is exactly the same as the bottom row. So there's an 11. There's the center, option one. And there's the 11 right there. And then in the center, option one, plain square, option one. Just like that. And then I'll let you look at the overall of it because it's really cute. So this is like a this is like a six inch block, I think. So see one, two, three, four, five, six, six even units going across. So if this was a six inch square that I wanted, and I know it's one, two, three, four, five, six, and that means one inch, one inch, one inch, one inch, one inch, one inch. So knowing if when you learn all of this and you know it, I can do this without looking at a chart or without using any paper. If I want this block and it's a six inch and I know it's one, two, three, four, five, six, these are an inch each. So to do my option 11 math, I double that to two, add an inch to three. So I would start with a three inch center square to get these option 11s to go in here. And then if these, um, uh, if so that means this is a two inch sewn, then that means this option one needs to be a two inch sewn. I'd go back to my chart and look at it. Okay. All right. So that's pretty much it for class. I do, if you have any last minute questions, get them in there. I want you to remember that the fabric sale goes to the end of the month and with a $150 order, you're going to get free shipping. Um, go back and watch some of the past videos we've done over the last two weeks. If you want to know more about the fabric sale, if, if today is your first time joining us, then you may not know about that. Also, remember that Quilt Club Week starts the end of September, the last week of September. Um, I've talked about those in detail on the other videos. And then, of course, Premium Club next week starts our very first class for Premium Club. And um, for this semester. So Premium Club does like a fall semester and a spring semester. And Quilt Club Week is also a part of it. So um, um, if you join Premium Club, you don't have to go in and pay for um, Quilt Club Week extra. It's just a part of it. And um, a lot of the, the fabrics for the New Paradise are different than what we normally work with. Normally, um, we think about like a light background and then putting like contrast with it. And the new, the new Paradise fabric is a lot like that, but there's a lot of mediums in there. And so sometimes people are like, oh, what happens if you put a medium and a medium together? So I want to tell you a quick story about this quilt right here, if we can move over to it. So we've got it folded in half. The main thing I want you to see are these blocks here that go around on the outside edges. So this is Letters to a Soldier. It's one of the classes in Premium Club. It's a book that you can get on the website. And so when we were making this, the very first quilt of it back years ago, I had some uh, good friends and some teachers and we were spending the time together to write the pattern and make the blocks and all that. One very good friend and teacher, she came up to me after we had made a couple of blocks and she said, I just don't think these colors are going to work the way that you think they are. She said, there's just not a lot of contrast. They're all kind of mediums together. Well, I, I told her, I said, yeah, I know, but I said, let's keep going. I said, this is kind of what I have in my head. Let's see if it works. I bet, I think it's going to work. Let's keep moving. Well, she came to me at least three different times, cautioning me and telling me that she didn't think these were going to work. And I'm like, well, just, just hold on. Let's give it a little bit longer. And if it doesn't, then we'll change something. So, you know, two days go by, we get the 24 blocks made, we start putting them together, and then we get the rest of the quilt put together. And she came back to me and she said, Jody, I don't know why I ever doubted you. It always works when you're, when you're putting a quilt together. She said, it is beautiful and I love it. So I wanted to show people this and think about it with the new Paradise Fabrics, with um, uh, using a lot of those mediums and putting them together. You'll have just enough contrast on them and it's just going to be be wonderful. Okay, so if you have not gotten 
all of the downloads that we've done previously in the last two or three weeks to get ready for our 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 big fall hoopla of premium club and quilt club week and the new paradise fabrics and the sale and everything go back in there we've done i think at least two videos with all of that but um next week on monday we will do our option overview class um i'm not sure the time if we had talked about the time maybe one o'clock because 11 o'clock will be our very first class for premium club so we'll have our 11 o'clock class for premium club have our first block it's a 20 inch block um saturday uh, just a couple of days ago we did a video where we talked about all the classes and showed the quilts and premium club and quilt club week and then also the stuff that is free that anybody can join so um um Monday, we will have option overview class. We'll do options three, nine, and 15, which is the flying goose ones. And then the following Monday, we'll do the option fours, which are the half square triangle ones. And then the last week of September on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, we have free stuff to work up to Quilt Club Week. And the, not this one, but that double star with the orange and purples that we had up here, that's one of those that we'll do during the Quilt Club Week. And, um, then on Mondays from now on at 11 o'clock, we will have our premium club. The week of Quilt Club week, we will not have premium club. And the week after on that Monday, we do not have premium club. So we'll have two that we'll miss, but you'll have all that Quilt Club week stuff to, to be enjoying. And then, so I think that second week of October is where we kick back in with every Monday being a premium club class, okay? Now, when we get through with Quilt Club week, for those of you that just watch the free stuff and the, the general public, you probably won't see me a while because we have been working hundreds of hours, uh, you know, 12 and 13 hour days to get the shipping for the, the fabrics done, for the sale to get all of our classes and our demos done and the patterns written and everything. So um, in October, if you're not watching the Monday Premium Club classes, you're not gonna see me anywhere else. So I'll be as my two-year-old grandson says, Mimi be nine-nine. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed. We'll see you next week. Wait. Question? Okay. Yeah, yeah. How many options are made from pre-cut fabrics? Like, uh, I guess during your series here, you're not really using pre-cuts, are you? No, because we're using three-inch center squares and strips. Squares and strips. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did do, uh, the last two Mondays, we had two free classes we did. Uh, soldiers comfort like two weeks ago and last Monday we did um, the pineapple spools and on the pineapple spools we talked about pre-cuts on that one of, of to do okay those charts if you're wanting to use pre-cuts go to those charts in the book those are a great place to say oh I got a 10 inch layer but cake do what, what can I do squares and strips. just squares and strips three inch um, squares and one and three fourths inch strips with the video today if you are on the email list if you're not on our email you've got to go to our website squareandasquare.com and put your email address in and you will get our emails and you'll get the downloads and you'll be notified when we're doing something and all that so um, and it also allows you to go into the public webinar area and go in and watch past uh, webinars that are free there's hundreds of hours hundreds of hours ditch your cable and just go in and watch uh, our quilting stuff we're on 24 7 if you have internet quilting never sleeps i may be sleeping in october but i'm still working on those videos don't forget about the quilt text hotline 817-713-2879 anytime you have questions about something quilting uh, quilting questions if you have questions about how to find something or how to order something or where is my order or all that, please do that as an email. We need to keep track of all of that for you. Because in the quilt text, I don't know who you are. It's, it's just a message. There's no anything with it. So when you say check on my order, I don't know who you are to check on your order. So it just saves you and us a lot of time if you do that kind of stuff with an email. All right, any last minute questions on there? And it, when it clicks off, we don't get the question so if you put something in last and we didn't address it it was already turned off so are we good all right see you next week bye